international arbitration. This lecture series has been organized by LIKE, Legal Information Knowledge and Expansion Partners, in association with Center for Research in International and Comparative Law, MNLU Aurangabad. LegitQuest is the knowledge partner along with Legitai. Prudentian Partners, founded in 2016 as one of the fastest growing law firms in Delhi, equipped with a very versatile team of attorneys, <clears throat> dedicated to provide best services and vital services across sectors such as civil, criminal, matrimonial, electricity, telecom, environmental banking, and commercial litigation, while also specializing in disputed property, having represented major corporations with major diverse business interests in India. LIKE is an online one-stop solution for all the updates of the provider platform to other budding brightest legal minds and ignite the culture of debate and deliberations across the fraternity. MNLU Aurangaba institution established in the year 2017 with an objective of imparting quality legal education. LegitQuest is an artificial intelligence-based legal research product. It is a state legal research platform for conducting legal research and is very well known for the introduction of the world's only one-click inside system called the iDraft Case Analytics. In short, the iDraft feature powered by artificial intelligence takes you to the issue, facts, arguments, reasoning, and decision of a case law. It also has started with Legitai recently, which has the views and columns and serves the stakeholders of judiciary. Now, today's topic is foreign awards and enforcement of foreign awards, and also carrying forward yesterday's topic of an arbitral award. I'm deeply honored to have Mr. Vikar C. Shukla as our team speaker. He is one of the founding partners in Prudentia and Partners. And as an experienced litigator, his fora of practice include the Supreme Court of India and several high courts, various tribunals, such as TDSAT, APTIL, and DRAT. He is a seasoned lawyer in appellate for service, education, electricity, consumer disputes, civil, criminal, and arbitration cases. He specializes in emerging fields, such as sports law, IBC, and labor reform private sector. He has worked with Sri P.S. Narsim rather than additional Solicitor General of India and assisted him in litigations of national importance and involving. He has also been an integral part of the mediation between the BCCI and the various state cricket associations in implementing the reforms suggested by the Justice Roda. In addition to the professional association as mentioned, he has represented clients like DMRC, Joy Lucas Private Limited, JK Cements, Videocon Group, and several distances of the country. So our today's session will be for 45 minutes, followed by a Q&A session. I would request all our participants to be on mute and without video throughout the session. Questions to the speaker can be written in the chat box, which will be taken at the end of the session at the time permit. I would now hand it over to Mr. Shukla. Sir, please. Thank you so much for the introduction. See, as I had requested yesterday that uh, uh, since yesterday, because of positive time, I could not cover enforcement of domestic awards. So today, apart from the foreign awards and enforcement of foreign awards, we would also discuss about the enforcement of domestic awards. In fact, what I intend to do is that when we discuss uh, enforcement, we take them parallelly, domestic and foreign, and we this way we'll also be able to draw a distinction as to what are the differences between the enforcement proceedings between different kinds of awards being the domestic and the foreign awards. So chapter eight of the Arbitration Act, which talks about the finality and enforcement of arbitral awards is the chapter where we are concerned with the enforcement of domestic awards. Section 35 says finality of arbitral awards, which says subject to this part, an arbitral award shall be final and binding on the parties and persons claiming under them respectively. Immediately next section 36 talks about enforcement, which very categorically says that where the time for making an application to set aside the arbitral award under section 34 has expired. That was three months, we, we remember. Yesterday we had discussed that. Then subject to the provisions of subsection two, such award shall be enforced in accordance with the provisions of the code of civil procedure in the same manner as if it is if it were a decree of the court. Now, before we move uh, ahead, 
it should be very important to point it out that this section from uh, uh, has been amended by way of an amendment of 2015 so this the clause which i read it existed pre amendment uh, amendment also the only distinction was that it was so worded because you will subsequently see that clause 2 clause 3 and a proviso has been added by the amendment of 2015 and we will see that the effect of proviso makes it now essential for a party to move an application before the court for staying of the award so before 2015 what the scenario was that the moment that award is challenged under section 34 there is an automatic stay there was a question also in this regard raised yesterday and i then requested that we deal this question tomorrow when i'm talking about the enforcement of awards so here what i'm trying to establish is that under section 36 when the pre amended section existed then the moment any party challenges any award under section 34 that application or petition under 34 itself was sufficient to stay for the proceedings so far as execution is concerned and there was an automatic stay but what the 2015 amendment act if you will read the objects and reasons of the act it very categorically clarifies that because of this a lot of delay is happening and only to overcome such delay this amendment has been brought under section 36 now what does clause 2 says let's read it where an application to set aside the arbitral award has been filed in the court under section 34 the filing of such an application shall not by itself render that award unenforceable it clarifies the previous position and then says unless the court grants an order of stay of the operation of the said arbitral award in accordance with the provisions of sub section 3 on a separate application made for that purpose then it further says in clause 3 upon filing of an application under sub section 2 for stay of the operation of the arbitral award the court may subject to such conditions as it may deem fit grant stay of the operation of such award for reasons to be recorded in writing then there's a proviso which says provided that the court shall while considering the application for grant of stay in the case of an arbitral award for payment of money have due regard to the provisions for grant of stay of a money decree under the provisions of the cpc now in addition to that on 4th of november the government has come up with an ordinance which has added one more proviso to this section in this regard also there was a question raised in yesterday's session this proviso what does it says it adds a second proviso it says provided further that where the court is satisfied that a prima facie case is made out a that the arbitration agreement or contract which is the basis of the award or b the making of the award was induced or affected by fraud or corruption it shall stay the award unconditionally pending disposal of the challenge under section 34 to the award now with this amendment what what 36 does is that it actually takes away the previous structure where the moment you move 34 automatic stay comes up interestingly this issue because the moment the stay uh, the, the the 2015 amendment act came obviously the parties then started filing a uh, stay applications and everything and the matter reached up to supreme court in bcci versus kochi private cricket uh, uh, limited it is a 2018 6 scc 287 wherein justice nariman what he did is that along with section uh, along with the 2015 amendment to clarify as to whether these amendments will be prospective or retrospective there was section 26 in the amendment act of 2015 the section 26 very categorically stated that nothing contained in this act shall apply to the arbitral proceedings commenced 
in accordance with the provisions of section 21 of the principal act before the commencement of this act unless the parties otherwise agree but but this act shall apply in relation to arbitral proceedings commenced on or after the date of the commencement of this act now what the problem arose before the court was that 26 was so worded that there were certain parties who interpreted 26 in such a way that even if the arbitration proceedings have commenced but at the stage of 32 34 when the award is being challenged then they can file a stay application in the clause 2 and the uh, subsequent execution of this uh, award can be stayed and this was argued in the supreme court from both ends one of the parties, obviously the ones who were award debtors, they wanted the automatic stay regime to continue. And they tried to argue that this amendment will apply only in those cases where the commencement of the arbitration has happened after the coming into force of the 2015 amendment. We've already seen in chapter five of the Arbitration Act, section 21 very categorically defines what is the commencement of the proceedings. The commencement of the proceedings would be deemed when one party has initiated arbitration proceedings and issued a notice to the other party for the appointment of an arbitrator. That is the commencement. Now the parties before the Supreme Court they tried to argue that because commencement has been categorically defined under the act under section 21, hence section, uh, amendments to section 36 will not apply in these cases. Whereas Justice Nariman very beautifully, he divided section 26 of the 2015 amendment in two parts. And he said that in the first part, because it is very clear that in terms of the provisions of section 21, he said that because it is very clear that in the first part, it has been added the words in terms of the provisions of arbitral proceedings initiated in terms of the provisions of section 21 have been added. Whereas in the second part, it is only written in relation to arbitration proceedings. So he breaked it into two parts and said that yes, the first part very categorically says that it would apply to all such proceedings a commencement which is under 21 but so far as the second part is concerned that, that does not talks about this strictly section 21 commencement but it talks about in relation to arbitration proceedings so he clarified that 26 can be interpreted in such a way that in all those cases where section 34 34 is being filed after the coming of the for, uh, force of 2015 36 will apply Interestingly, Justice Nariman, because during the arguments, the Union of India had submitted in its reply that they are considering to bring another amendment to the Act by way of adding a Section 87 to the Act, by which they are clarifying that even court proceedings will also be covered by this amendment. So in paragraph 77 and 78 in BCCI Kochi, Justice Nariman had categorically requested the government not to bring any such amendment because if you bring any such amendment it will bring it will bring the whole position so far as arbitration is concerned to back burner but the government did not agree and by way of an amendment in 2019 they added section 87 which clarified the position and nullified the effect of bcci versus kochi what justice nariman had said in bcci versus kochi and he bifurcated 26 into two parts and said that 21 and court proceedings are different by way of this amendment by way of section 87 the government the parliament clarified that no this amendment will apply only prospectively so far as both the positions are concerned now this was challenged by way of a writ petition under article 32 before the supreme court in hindustan construction company versus union of india this is 2019 SCC online Supreme Court 1520. In this, there were certain other issues. There was a constitutional validity of a provision of IBC was also challenged, but we are not concerned with that. All that we are concerned with, with is the constitutional validity of section 87, which was added by the 2019 amendment. So in that, again, Justice Nariman only, he actually struck down 87 
on the basis of two things one that he said that if you do not uh, interpret section 36 the way it has been interpreted in bcci versus kochi it actually uh, annuls the objects and reasons which were mentioned with the 2015 amendment and hence he said that this amendment and bringing of 87 is violative of article 14 and arbitrary and he is stuck down so th this position has now come into effect that bcci uh, versus kochi has clarified the only difficulty which i see with the bcci versus kochi is that justice nariman has only given a clarification so far as section 34 is concerned but there were certain other amendments which were brought by 2015 in section 9 in section 16 in section 17 what happens to those amendments when this issue was raised justice nariman said that we are not concerned with that issue and he did not give any finding so if similar situations are to be applied in 9 uh, section 9 proceedings and 18 and 17 also then the impact will be absolutely different so that's a problem and i'm sure that in the in the coming days that problem will also be uh, uh, faced and will reach up to the supreme court now coming back to our today's topic which is enforcement we will have to first of all understand that why an award needs to be enforced and what is enforcement right so we've all understood that arbitrations are private party proceedings away from courts this is generally applied or used by uh, people to save their time and money now the award has come parties have appeared before the arbitrator and after the proceedings the award has come now the only thing is that you will see that in a court if if somebody does not follow the court order then there are certain ways of doing it like the court may initiate contempt proceedings in civil cases after the execution if you don't do then there are certain uh, uh, provisions in law by which you can be sent to uh, prison or your properties may be attached and say uh, uh, sold and then after the uh, amount can be ascertained but so far as an arbitration is concerned the arbitrator does not has those powers because obviously he might be uh, he he may be anybody he may be a, an individual sitting somewhere else if the seat of arbitration is somewhere else so once an award has come into existence the effect of the award will be only if the party gets the benefit which he has got into the in the award and for that enforcement proceedings are very essential so before the coming of the 1996 act this enforcement proceedings and arbitration they were governed by three different laws but the 1996 act uh, amalgamated all these three different laws and have uh, created a code uh, by which it takes care the domestic and 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 foreign awards together by way of part 1 and part 2 as we have already discussed in the previous sessions happened so far as the domestic uh, award is concerned Uh, once the award is passed and 34 proceedings are over either and uh, let's say the 34 is dismissed 37 is dismissed and and 136 in supreme court is also dismissed that means the award has uh, 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 has reached finality then an execution petition can be filed that is called enforcement we will see in the next steps how where this execution petition should be filed these execution petitions or enforcement petitions are filed in terms of the cpc as mentioned as we have read in section 36 of this act there's there's order 21 in the cpc which talks about execution of decrees so once an award has reached the finality it should be treated uh, and and execution proceedings have initiated it is treated like a court's decree and executed so for the domestic award the only thing is that there's already a time frame 3 months time waiting under section 34 and if 34 proceedings have initiated then uh, uh, once it reaches finality and once it has reached the finality the parties are then free to file an execution petition or enforcement petition before the appropriate court now when it comes to uh, this enforcement part i will uh, i will deal parallelly so far as domestic and and foreign uh, awards are concerned 
so when it comes to enforcement of foreign awards we will we will see that all these proceedings which are uh, provisions which are mentioned in part 1 like your 34 and 37 is not available in foreign awards because these are the awards which are passed in a different jurisdiction uh, and are governed by different laws so obviously when the when a foreign award is passed the challenge to those foreign awards will lie in different countries as the case may be if it has been passed in london or uh, us or singapore as we all know then once that those proceedings have culminated and and again like your domestic award that award has reached finality then of course for enforcement it will have to come back to india because if somebody has to get money from some uh, from an indian entity or from an indi indian individual he or she or that company will have to come to india to get it enforced because the properties the bank accounts everything is in india so foreign awards also like domestic awards once they have attained finality they have to be brought back in india and enforcement proceedings like domestic awards only are initiated so far as foreign awards are concerned in both the in both of these only one uh, uh, appeal is given and no, uh, no opportunity for any second appeal is given now so far as foreign awards are concerned what are the requirements we'll have to see section 47 very categorically mentions that Uh, 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 when we talk about the requirements of foreign awards the most important thing is that the award should be there so original award or a duly authenticated copy in the manner required by the country where it was made and along with that foreign award the authentic copy of the foreign award the original agreement or duly certified copy of the agreement is required third uh, aspect of it is the evidence necessary to prove that the award is a foreign award shall also be produced for that section 47 clarifies that what, what is the evidence it says the party applying for the enforcement of a foreign award shall at the time of application produce before the court one the original award or the copy thereof duly authenticated as we mentioned second the original agreement third such evidence as may be necessary to prove that the award is a foreign award and for that it is in clause 2 it says if the award or agreement to be produced under subsection 1 is in foreign language the party seeks to enforce the award shall also produce a translation into english uh, uh, an authentic translation from from the diplomatic or consular agent in that uh, country so these three things are essential if if an enforcement of foreign award has to be done now we come to conditions for enforcement of arbitral awards we've already seen section 36 and 35 now so far as the uh, foreign awards are concerned section 48 is important which talks about the conditions for enforcement of foreign awards when you will see section 48 and you will compare it with section 34 there are a lot of ingredients which are similar but still the only distinction is that in 34 the investigation by the court is at a different level but in 48 it is not such because a foreign award would have already crossed the stage of 34 in its own country and then it has come in india but still 48 says enforcement of a foreign award may be refused at the request of a party against whom it is invoked only if that party furnishes to the court proof that the parties to the agreement referred to in section 44 were under law applicable to them under some incapacity like it is in 34 or the said agreement is not valid under the law to which the parties have subjected it or failing any indication thereon under the law of the country where the award was made or the party against whom the award is invoked was not given proper notice not following the natural justice the award deals with a different difference not contemplated by or not falling within the terms of the submission of to arbitration or it contains decisions on matters beyond the scope of submission to arbitration then like 34 there's a proviso here also which talks about separation that if if it is possible that those disputes which were not either submitted before the arbitrator or are not 
under the terms of the contract which are referred then they they should be separated uh, the other ground is the composition of the arbitral tribunal or authority uh, the the composition of the arbitral authority or the arbitral procedure was not in accordance with the agreement of the parties or failing such agreement was not in accordance with the law of the country where the arbitration took place then e which says the award has not yet become binding on the parties or has been set aside or suspended by the competent authority of the country in which or under the law of which that award was made so if the award was challenged like r32 34 proceedings in that country and it has been set aside or there is a stay going on or it has not attained finality then also it cannot be executed enforcement of an award may also be refused if the court finds that a the subject matter of the difference is not capable of settlement by arbitration under the law of india so if it's not arbitrable uh, in one of the sessions uh, my friend has discussed this point as to what are the issues which are arbitrable in india so that's also one of the grounds on which the enforcement can be denied or refused b the enforcement of the award would be contrary to public policy of india this public policy doctrine again we will see through case laws in the next few minutes the way we have seen 34 yesterday all those cases saw pipes and everything similar logic is applied here to foreign awards also and we will also see how the supreme court has drawn a distinction that public policy under section 48 has to be interpreted narrower than the public policy which is uh, mentioned under section 34 apart from that there is an explanation which says for the avoidance of any doubt it is clarified that an award is in conflict with the public policy of india only if one the making of the award was induced or affected by fraud or corruption or was in violation of section 75 or 81 or it is in contravention with the fundamental policy of indian law three it is in conflict with the most basic notions of morality and justice the first part of it is nothing but what has now been added as an amendment under section 36 second proviso to bring uh, to to get a stay if prima facie these conditions are fine found now apart from this there are so far as your domestic awards are concerned there are stamping stamping requirements also so stamping requirements in domestic awards may vary from state to state Uh, like in maharashtra the, the the state act says that a stamp of 500 would be sufficient uh, whereas in delhi the the law is that 0.1% of the value uh, needs uh, the stamp to the value of 0.1% of the value or dispute uh, needs to be uh, given as a stamp duty but, but so far as foreign awards are concerned no such stamping is required because you know the supreme court has uh, uh, clarified this in a uh, 2018 judgment uh, this is messer shriram epc limited versus rio glass solar where the supreme court has categorically said that foreign award is not liable to be stamped now we come to the forums as to where these enforcement proceedings can be filed because that is a very important question in order to understand the execution we also need need to understand as to where these proceedings can be filed the the supreme court in its re, uh, 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 recent judgment in sundaram finance versus abdul samad clarified that an award holder can initiate execution proceedings before any court in india where assets are located in case the subject matter of the arbitration is of a specified value now this specified value this term is explained under the commercial courts act commercial courts established under the commercial courts uh, commercial division and commercial appellate division of high courts of 2015 would have jurisdiction now we'll see uh, one by one as to which courts will have uh, jurisdiction in which cases Uh, the first category is of the awards arising out of uh, indian seated arbitration like uh, your domestic domestic awards so by virtue of the commercial courts act and the amendment act the commercial division of a high court where assets of the opposite party lie shall have the jurisdiction for applications relating to enforcement of such awards if the subject matter is money now if the subject matter is something else in any other case commercial division of the high court 
which would have jurisdiction as if the subject matter of the award was a subject matter of a suit shall have jurisdiction that is where the opposite party resides or carries on business or personally works for gain so this distinction in terms of money and property is only because let's say for for property if again a problem will arise so if a if if an award which an execution if it is filed in a jurisdiction where the property is not situated then even if the award is executed let's say i'm just saying although it is against the law but i'm just telling you the practical difficulty that why it has been formulated like this that if you file an execution in a jurisdiction where the property itself is not situation situated then again the execution will be problem so that is why it has been worded like this now the second category is that award arising out of an indian seated arbitration uh not being an international commercial arbitration in this as per the commercial courts act and the amendment act for such cases the appropriate court would be the commercial court exercising such jurisdiction which would have which would ordinarily lie before any principal civil court of original jurisdiction in a district as well as the commercial division of a high court in exercise of its ordinary original civil jurisdiction now the third category which we'll discuss is the foreign awards where the subject matter is money in foreign awards the commercial division of any high court in india where assets of the opposite party lie shall have jurisdiction in case of any other subject matter commercial division of a high court which would have jurisdiction as if the subject matter of award was a subject matter of a suit shall have jurisdiction another important aspect is limitation now so far as limitation is concerned domestic awards it's uh, the limitation act is very clear that it applies to arbitrations as well and the limitation period for enforcement of such awards is 12 years it is given and this has been affirmed by supreme court also in in uh, several cases for foreign awards the act provides that certain conditions have to be assessed prior to the enforcement of a foreign award and where the court is satisfied that the foreign award is enforceable the award would be deemed to be a decree of that court in such cases in such cases also the limitation would be same 12 years so the only uh, problem uh, uh, which arises in this uh, we'll have we'll we'll uh, try to draw a distinction in this is that you will see that part 2 of the arbitration act itself is divided in two categories one is the new york convention and the other is geneva convention so there has to be a reason why these two categories are mentioned the the the, the two categories are because in in the first category we have the recipro reciprocative countries where india uh, uh, the central government itself keeps notifying that these are the countries with, with with which we have such relations that our judgments will be executed easily in those countries and their judgments will be executed easily in this country but there are certain other countries which are uh, or the arbitration might have been proceeded in a country which is not signatory to new york convention or geneva convention what happens in such cases although parties are very careful and they understand implications so such uh, uh, issues may very very in very rare cases it may arise but of course it may arise so that's why these two distinctions are mentioned in the arbitration act in part 2 also now after this we'll we'll now look into the case laws as to how the supreme court in in foreign awards has proceeded we yesterday while uh, the, discussing section 34 we we seen that how the supreme court uh, step by step initiate uh, initiating from saw pipes and up to the uh, xiong yong and associate builders have tried to you know bring in some clarity into arbitration proceedings one has to understand that uh, from a uh, commercial perspective from the business point of view also if the arbitration proceedings in a country are not effective then uh, the the first impact which i can see is that it will affect the foreign investments because the investors then they will be very or they'll be fearful of investing in this country because they'll realize that if there's a dispute or if there and and these disputes are are 
so common in in commercial agreements disputes are bound to arise so if such disputes happen even if the seat of arbitration is somewhere else and then the the uh, procedural law of the arbitration the substantial law of uh, uh, of the contract is is not indian but even then the enforcement has to be done in india so if the enforcement takes time then also it's problematic and foreign investors will run away from this country so and the courts understand this difficulty but but when it comes to law the law has to be applied in its letter and spirit so far as the interpretation is concerned that's in control of the court and and by way of the case laws we will see that the courts also understand these problems and they try to bring in such interpretations which help in proper development of the law given the scenario and circumstances so in this in this scenario the the first case which we should discuss uh, is the renu sagar power limited although this case is prior to the coming of the 1996 act but we will see that why this case is important this nate renu sagar private uh, power limited versus general electrics company is a 1994 supplementary 1 scc 644 this the opinion was written by justice agarwal sc agarwal now what happened in this case is that this renu sagar power limited was an indian company and general electrics company was a us company renu sagar in a in a district in up uh, near mirzapur in sonbhadra it it decided it decided to come up with a power plant and of course it was being sub, uh, subsidized also by the government of india by certain you know by giving certain tax deductions so it entered a, into an agreement with this us company which was sub, uh, supposed to supply machinery and equipments for this power plants and the the agreement was entered and uh, there was a payment schedule made between the parties in terms of the agreement that uh, the payment will be made in this 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 way what happened is that uh, a default uh, arose and uh, arbitration proceedings in paris were initiated now uh, once the uh, award was passed in 1985 86 enforcement proceedings were initiated uh, before the bombay high court under section 5 of the foreign awards act because now we are talking about a scenario where our 96 act had not come into existence and we were governed by a different law altogether so far as foreign awards enforcement is concerned now uh, once that enforcement proceedings were initiated in the bombay high court the single judge he allowed that and he said that the award is fine and it should be enforced when the renu sagar filed its appeal before the high court the appeal was also the db which is similar to our 37 proceedings that was also dismissed so what renu sagar was trying to argue here in this case is that this award which is in past it is violating section 7 of the foreign awards act which was similar to the public policy doctrine which we discussed today which had said that there are certain things which are fundamentally against uh, fund, uh, which are against the fundamental policy of india those awards cannot be executed but this argument did not sound good to the single judge bench as well as the division bench of the bombay high court and they both uh, a single bench allowed the execution proceedings and the division bench dismissed it now when the matter reached the supreme court the supreme court analyzed the position and when it heard the arguments and realized that the award has been passed in such a way that it violates certain provisions of fera in india and because of this reason the supreme court said that it is actually violating the uh, public policy doctrine and the supreme court in this case for the first time said that conflict with public policy of india would imply conflict with any of the three things which are those three things the first is fundamental policy of india second is interest of india and the third is justice and morality so if if any of these three things exist it will be presumed that it is in conflict with the public policy doctrine this Ren renu sagar is the same case relying on which in saw pipes the supreme court had added a fourth criteria of patent illegality now we'll see in the subsequent case in the next case in this series that how the the parties tried to argue because the second case came when the 1996 had come into existence 
and the the parties had the benefit of ongc saw pipes also which had actually widened the implications of public policy doctrine by adding another uh, ingredient into it it of patent illegality so the second case which we'll discuss on this issue is fulchan exports limited versus ooo patriot this is a 2011 10 scc 300 decision here justice lodha had written the judgment and uh, the the dispute was that this uh, fulchan exports limited was an indian company and oo patriot was a russian company and there was a by as a by Uh, supply and purchase agreement entered between uh, both the parties where this indian entity was supposed to uh, supply them uh, these these were called some uh, indian long grains sale of 1000 metric uh, ton of indian long grains so indian a uh, company was supposed to supply it to the russian company now what happened is that uh, in terms of the agreement the indian company shipped those grains to russia and the the vessel left the indian port from kondla but in between the because of the engine failure the vessel never reached russia so when when inordinate delay happened the uh, the other uh, russian company started writing letters to the indian company and the dispute arose and it was sent to the uh, to to arbitration it was referred to arbitration in terms of the arbitration clause now the arbitrator interestingly here he looked into the principles of contract law and he said that uh, you see the the seller had sent the goods and it has not reached you and the 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 implication cannot be solely put on the seller so the arbitrator gave half the cost against the indian company so he he looked into the principles of un unjust enrichment and everything and he passed a reasonable award saying that okay not the whole amount but at least half both of you should suffer the the damages now once the award was passed the enforcement proceedings again were initiated before the bombay high court which were allowed and the division bench uh, when the appeal was filed by the indian company the division bench dismissed it the section 37 uh, petition and then the matter reached before the supreme court now in the supreme court the again the public policy doctrine came up and the patent illegality as it has been held in saw pipes was argued by the indian company the fulchand exports limited and they tried to argue that the arbitrator had gone beyond the terms of the contract and hence it is patently illegal and in terms of the definition of ongc saw pipes this court is now uh, uh, bound to uh, apply the patent illegality doctrine into this case also and to this justice lodha actually agreed but on the facts of the case it, he dismissed the slp but he actually agreed that even in section 48 proceedings even in in proceedings which we, where enforcement of foreign awards is being done the interpretation given by ongc saw pipes would apply and patent illegality also would be looked in but on the facts of the case he dismissed the slp now the next case is shri lal mahal versus progato grano spa in this case interestingly similar ag agreement was uh, entered between these two again uh, the the progato grano spa was a, a, a russian company and shri lal mahal was an indian company and there was a an agreement to deliver durum wheat there's a specific uh, quality of this wheat which was ent uh, the agreement was entered between the parties for supply of 22000 metric ton of durum wheat and uh, the agreement was entered and the supply was initiated now in one such instance in one shipment what happened is that uh, when when the 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 wheat reached the russian port the the the, the company inspected the quality of the wheat and found that this is not the quality of, of of the wheat which was agreed between the parties and accordingly they sent a uh, immediately they sent a notice to the indian company saying that uh, this is not the quality of uh, wheat which we had agreed and hence you are you stand in violation of the agreement and for the breach of contract they initiated arbitration proceedings 
so when the arbitration proceedings were initiated the indian uh, uh, party tried to argue before the arbitrator that the agreement provided that the inspection will be done on the indian land when the shipment is about to move that inspection was done now the agency which inspected the quality of wheat that was also selected by the russian company and the same agency has submitted its report its report so now once the same agency which is mentioned in the uh, in the agreement between the parties and the way it has been mentioned that the inspection will be done on the indian land while the shipment is being done if that has been done then second inspection when the, the when the wheat has reached in moscow is violation of the terms uh, terms of the contract but uh, of course the, the this argument did not sound good to the arbitrator and he passed the award against the indian entity now again same same issue uh, happened here the enforcement proceedings were filed objections were raised objections were dismissed 37 also they failed when the matter reached the supreme court then patent uh, illegality doctrine again came up very interestingly this judgment was also written by justice lodha who had written the previous judgment of fulchan where he had agreed that the ongc saw pipes reasoning is absolutely correct and it should be made applicable to foreign awards also but uh, by this time in a span of 3 to 4 uh, years better sense prevailed and justice lodha realized that if if public policy would be interpreted in such a way like justice nariman had realized by the time associate builders came in 2015 before the amendment justice lodha also realized that if saw pipes interpretation is to be given to foreign award then definitely these foreign investors or foreign companies they will they will uh, they will be fearful of entering into agreements and realizing his mistake he overruled that finding of fulchan in one of the paragraphs in this judgment and he said that although one of us who had written that judgment we realized that that finding was not correct and the true position of law would be of renu sagar which had initially given only three criteria that if the award is in breach of the fundamental policy of india and second if it is against the interest of india and third if it violates any clauses of justice or morality only then it can be said that it violates public policy otherwise no now apart from these two recent decisions which are very important in this uh, uh, discussion are one is vijay karya and the other is national agriculture cooperative called nefed judgment both of these judgments interestingly have been delivered by justice nariman and in 2019 and both of these judgments when we will see into the facts we will realize that how public policy actually what will amount to the fundamental public policy or the interest of india or justice or morality and how courts interfere in nefed what happened is that nefed is a Uh, government owned subsidiary it entered into uh, an agreement uh, with a uh, uh, with with a alimenta a russian company again and said that uh, nefed will supply them 5000 metric tons of groundnut at a certain cost and in the agreement it was mentioned that it is an indian subsidiary and uh, and they have to take permission uh, from the government before supplying these things and they they were uh, uh, they were allotted annual quota by the government so after the entering of the agreement nefed's quota of groundnut was reduced by the government because of which they failed to supply the the promised the 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 promised uh, amount of groundnut to this russian company and hence the dispute arose and uh, the the award was passed and the award was passed and for enforcement proceedings they came uh, to india and similar uh, same fate happened a single judge allowed the enforcement proceedings db dismissed it when the matter reached before the supreme court it is here that justice nariman he looked into it and he while interpreting and uh, the uh, he said that although in saw pipes and in fulchan in all these cases we discussed all these things but here when the government itself had under under its indian acts 
has had fixed tariffs and quotas to this particular company that they cannot get more than this then they cannot be bound and it is here that they said that the fundamental policy of india and interest of nation these doctrines come into rescue and in nefed they applied the public policy doctrine in this case in nefed which we are discussing they applied the public policy doctrine and they held that yes the award is bad and they set aside and they did not enforce so this discussion of section 48 and when you compare it with section 34 you will see that the supreme court in nefed and in in the previous judgments have now very categorically said that the public policy doctrine mentioned in in section 34 has to be given uh, and uh, and when compared with section 48 the 34 can be given a wider implication but 48 has to be interpreted narrowly that has been further fortified by the amendment of 2015 which we had already discussed yesterday by adding section subsection 2a in the act which further clarifies as to what will amount to patent illegality and no such clarification is mentioned under section 48 so this clarification also brings in very much clarity for the uh, for the courts that when they are interpreting public policy so far as foreign awards are concerned that interpretation has to be a narrow interpretation when compared with the public policy which is mentioned under section 34 so with this i think i have uh, covered so far as your section 48 is concerned thank you so much thank you so that was now uh, we have some questions with us the first one is that uh, do you think that the indian courts continue to grapple with clearly determining foreign awards i i am really very sorry your voice is breaking and i can't hear anything same is the problem with me i think it's a problem with the moderators system yeah is it uh, coming fine now Mm. Yes. Uh, am I audible now, sir? Yes, you are. Please go ahead. The first question is: uh, Do you think that the Indian courts continue to grapple with clearly? Did I am sorry. I've lost you again. I think some internet issues. Uh, she must be getting back. Huh? Just give us a uh, two to five minutes. Just give us a little while. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. In the meanwhile, if you would like to answer the questions in the chat box, 
Yeah, but the the only difficulty is that I can't see them in my chat box. Otherwise, I would have started that. Uh, okay, they must have. Yeah, they are coming privately. Okay, one second. Let me put it uh, on the channel. Yeah. So can you see now? Uh, whether an award can be partly challenged and enforced simultaneously? Can you please throw some light on demonstration of award? So far as the registration of award is concerned, the registration of award is essential only when it concerns immovable property. Otherwise, an award is not mandatory to be registered. And so far as a part, a part challenge to an award, that is, I think, a very regular thing which is done by the parties during the arbitration proceedings. So in, in, you will have to understand that if an order or an award is passed and if you are aggrieved only by a portion or a portion of the finding of the arbitrator, then we will obviously challenge it, challenge it partly only. But once you've challenged it in part, then for execution, you cannot go for the other part and say that I have challenged only one part of it. And so the second part can be executed. That, that's a difficult thing because what will happen in that situation is that let's say, Although it's not possible, but I'm just trying to explain the difficulty. The difficulty would be an award is passed. There were five claims. Three of them go unchallenged and two were challenged. Now against the three, if you go for enforcement and subsequently those two also will attain finality. And one of them is again uh, left uh, by the court and said that the finding of the tribunal was correct. Then will you initiate the second execution proceedings for that single uh, loan leftover claim? So that's why that part enforcement is not possible. The award can be enforced in totality only. Hello, sir. I'm so sorry. There was some internet issue from my end. So now we can uh, continue the session. Uh, the I hope I'm audible to you right now. Yes, you are. Yeah. Uh, the first question is, do you think that the Indian courts continue to grapple with clearly determining the limitation period applicable to petitions for enforcement of foreign awards. I didn't get the question. Can you just repeat it again? Uh, it says it, or uh, do you think that the Indian courts uh, continue to grapple with the issue of determining the limitation period applicable to petitions for enforcement of foreign awards? Well, I don't think, I don't think it is the situation and it, I don't think it, it, it has been the situation any time. See, the, so far as the limitation is, is concerned, the law is now very clear and it has been established case by case, case by case that the, the, the limitation is clear. Okay, okay, sir. Uh, the second question is it, uh, can we say that pro-enforcement approach has been adopted by Indian courts in the case of challenges posed by Indian parties on the basis of foreign exchange law? See, pro-enforcement approach actually it was initiated uh, from the US itself. Uh, so most of the countries now you will see that pro-enforcement, if, if, if the pro-enforcement approach was not there, why would we distinguish public policy for domestic cases differently, uh, domestic awards differently, and public policy for foreign awards differently? Obviously there's a pro-enforcement approach and that's why there's a very niche and given section uh, under which the awards can be challenged. Okay. Uh, so this question uh, uh, was from yesterday, which says that can the enforcing court stay the enforcement proceedings pending the outcome of proceedings to set aside the award at the seat of arbitration? If so, will the court order the party seeking the state to provide security? No, I'm sorry, I didn't get the question. Can you just, just repeat it again and, and go a little slow, please? Yeah, sorry. It says that can the enforcing court stay the enforcement proceedings pending the outcome of proceedings to set aside the award at the seat of arbitration? If so, will the court order the party seeking the stay to provide security? No, I don't think that's, uh, that's, uh, that, that, that's possible. Okay, okay, sir. Uh, the next question is that, uh, what is the remedy in the cases wherein even if an award issued by an arbitration seated in India is not enforceable in the jurisdiction of some other country? It is basically, uh, the topic is about enforcement of foreign awards from non-reciprocating countries. Uh, uh, can you just repeat the question again? 
it says that uh, what is the remedy in the cases wherein even if an award issued by an arbitration seated in india is not enforceable in the jurisdiction of some other country see that will see if you are talking about the enforcement of that country then see every country has different enforcement laws like we have rcpc which has a specific order 21 which talks about the execution of award so in 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 this country as per the arbitration act is concerned it gives under section 48 under section 35 36 the conditions when the award will be deemed as a decree so similar laws will be applicable in those countries also so those those uh, it will depend on the laws of that country that how it will be executed and enforced i think i've lost you again to lip Yeah, I said that uh, we are done with the questions for today, and this was a very insightful session. Thank you for being here with us, and we appreciate you being here. And we thank attendees also for being here with us, and we hope to see you tomorrow as well for tomorrow's session. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.